Well, I say thank you very much. I mean, this, this talk is sort of, um, you know, it's two halves, really. One is talking about the problem we're going to try and solve, which is what the title behind me says. And then the other uh, is actually how we solved it in practice and actually how we made it work, uh, which turned out to be a much bigger struggle than we originally thought it would be. So what are we trying to do? Um, basically, to, to give this sort of setup, we have this access to this database of high-frequency data. So for those of you who are not in finance, uh, most financial databases, if you go onto the web and look at share prices, what you get is just the closing price, the price at the end of the day. Uh, but what we can also get hold of is high frequency data. So this is every single trade, every single thing that happens through the day, you get a record. Uh, you get a price or you get a trade happened at this price. Um, and to give you an idea, this database only goes back to 2007. It covers every sort of equity in the world and it's about a petabyte of data. So it's a big hunk of data, uh, physically moving it around. Funny, we were talking about earlier about the state of the UBS network, uh, which is dire. Um, actually trying to do anything with this data, one of your problems is how do you sort of ship it around? Because the data sits in London, and if you're not in London, you know, what do you do? Because you really don't want to start pulling sort of terabytes of data over our uh, internet connection. It makes you very unpopular. Um, but what we're wanting to do here, and the problem we wanted to solve, uh, is very simple. Uh, which is take our stock return, so take a week's worth of data for every single stock in a certain universe, and calculate a covariance matrix. Now, this sounds like a really easy problem. Just take a bunch of numbers, convert them to returns, and calculate covariances. But it, it, it doesn't work like that. There are a lot of theoretical problems, and I'll try and touch on those. And then we come to the second half of this, which is actually how we implemented this in practice. Because uh, effectively, we went through at least four programming languages, uh, five if you include a slight detour we took, um, to actually come up with something that we could actually use in, effectively in production, so to run every single weekend. So why do we care? Uh, you know, why, why are we doing this? Well, the answer is that if you have this covariance matrix of between all these different stocks, then you can basically measure risk. So if I've got a portfolio uh, and I'm, I'm worried about short-term risks, I can calculate those risks. And that's why we're trying to do this. Um, you can also calculate what are called high-frequency betas, which is effectively how sensitive is my stock to moves in the, sh in the market. And again, you know, most of this stuff is normally done on daily data. So all the things I'm going to talk about for the next sort of half an hour are completely irrelevant in a sense. Because on daily data, this stuff is easy. You know, it takes seconds, if, if that. It probably takes you longer to get all the data out of the database than it does to actually do any calculations. Um, but why do we care about this? Well, this is a picture of um, uh, the green line here, for those of you who can see it, is just the betas. These are the sensitivities to the market uh, calculated over a six-month window. Uh, this is Tesco's, by the way, uh, is the share, the share underlying this picture. And what you can see is just every so often... Um, there are moments here where my long-term sort of the beta is quite low, but the short-term one really, really spikes. And that's telling you all this, for that short period, Tesco's is really risky. Um, and that's useful to know, which you don't pick up from the six months of daily data. Uh, that was the reason it did that, by the way, is it had a huge profit warning. Um, and so that's really when these things are useful. Otherwise, most of the time, as you can see, the black line, the, daily, the five day beta, sort of wiggles around the six month beta. So a lot of the time, what you're getting is a noisy estimate. But occasionally, when you get the, sort of the two circles I've put on here, there's something interesting going on. And that's really where we see these things as being useful. Um, so let's just talk about the, the problem. I mean, high frequency data has been. Um, well, well, what high-frequency data allows us to do is stuff that's really been around since a guy called Bob Merton came up with something called um, the Intertemporal Cap Capital Asset Pricing Model back in 1973. And what he said is, you know, stocks' sensitivity to the market, stocks' risks change over time. Now, I mean, it, it sounds sort of obvious, and yet somehow it was quite a radical idea. And there's been loads of academic papers here. I've just sort of quoted a few. Um, that really pick up on this. And also, what we find is there's a lot of other things that you, going on in finance. Uh, what are called value stocks tend to outperform. Low volatility stocks tend to outperform. Um, and some of those you can pick up, some of those you can explain by the fact your betas are actually changing. 
So, or your covariances are changing, same thing. Um, the problem is, if everything was sort of, if the world was perfect and sort of fitted all our models, this would be really easy. Uh, however, you know, the world doesn't work like that. And there are basically three major problems we have here. Um, the first one is you'd never actually observe the true share price. It's a latent variable. What you observe is prices at which people trade. And in particular, there's what's called a bid offer bounce. You know, people buy at one price and sell at another. And so what you're getting is this time series wiggles backwards and forwards around some unobservable true value. Um, the second problem is some stocks don't trade very often. So if you're trying to, say, use 15-minute data, which is what we settle on here, um, that's fine for stocks in the FTSE 100 for your large cap names. But if you start going down even into the FTSE 250 uh, or you know, slightly smaller stocks elsewhere in the world, it becomes a big hassle. You have lots of missing data, effectively. Um, and the third problem is stocks trade at different times. So, you know, not everything trades on exactly the same period. What does this mean? Well, the first one, the fact that stocks, don't trade, stocks trade on this bid-ask bounce, they, also stock prices are discrete. You can't, yeah, they're not a continuous variable. So all of that means your bias of variance goes up. Your, your estimate of variance is biased up. The asynchronicity, however, the fact that stocks trade at different times, actually biases your covariances to zero. And that, again, that's funny enough, it's something else that was pointed out in the 70s uh, by a guy called Epps. Um, and there's a third problem, which I might not touch on because it's, it's just because of time. Um, I, I'll skip over sort of one at that slide. The, there's a lot of details you have to go into. You know, what period do we use? One day, five days, what frequency? Uh, actually, how do you measure time becomes an interesting one here as well. Um, do you use equal intervals of time or unequal intervals of time? What do you do about the fact that stocks don't trade overnight? Uh, and so there's lots of different things here. And also, because everything we're trying to estimate here, the variance, the covariance, or the beta, this sensitivity to the market, they're all latent variables. They're all unobservable. And therefore, you have actually statistical problems in actually telling whether you have a good one. Because how do I know if my forecast is good of something that I can't actually observe? And, and there's some very interesting papers, good papers out there that talk about this problem. Um, Andrew Patton, in particular, has written one or two good ones. Uh, so, liquidity is my first issue. This is what I talked about earlier. So, this is looking at, on the x-axis, what, what weight is a stock in the FTSE, FTSE 350? The red dots are the FTSE 100. The blue dots are the FTSE 250. So, that's the big cap and small cap. And up the side is the log of the average number of trades per day. So the dotted line there going across is one trade a minute. And so you can see everything in the FTSE 100 trades more than one trade a minute. The one at the bottom trades eight times a day. The one right in the bottom left-hand corner down here trades eight times a day. If I'm using 15-minute data, I have a problem. You know, the, the trading day has a lot more than eight data points. How do you deal with that? The covariance issue, this is the realized variance uh, problem. So this is, um, this is called, um, th this is a nice plot to sort of illustrate my hassle. What I do is I sample, this is Microsoft. I either sample Microsoft share price every 60 minutes or every 30, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, all the way down to, uh, I think I went down to about a second or two. Um, and so this is now the estimate of the volatility of that stock. So if I use 60-minute data, I get the volatility is about 14%. If I use one, it, wasn't, it might have been 10-second data, I get 24%. So that 10% difference is all down to the fact that we don't observe the real share price. We observe when it trades. That's the bid-ask bounce. To illustrate the opposite, uh, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, to illustrate the opposite problem for correlation... Same trick now for uh, Rio Tinto is the stock I picked for this one against the FTSE 100. Drop the, um, drop the frequency and you can see the correlation falls from about 0.55 down to about 0.2. So by changing the period, I, I get completely different values of the things I care about. The volatility or the variance and the covariances. So how do we solve this? 
Um, well, the algorithm we came up to, there's, there's a lot of solutions in the literature. This, this whole data has only really become available over the last few years, and, and really databases and processing has only really been powerful enough to cope with this volume of data for a few years. And therefore, it is a field, you know, wonderful place for academics to go and dig for a paper. So there's loads of approaches that they've come up with. The approach we've taken is from a paper from 2013, and effectively what we're saying here is we have two problems. One of which is we have an unobservable price, and the second one is we have missing data. And there are two very standard algorithms we can use to cope with that, one of which is the Kalman filter. A Kalman filter is a very good way of sort of taking a noisy series and trying to pull out the true thing underneath it. And the second one is we use expectation maximization, EM algorithm, to fill in the missing data. So this was great. So what we sort of said is we want to sample our data. I mean, here, I've, my picture here, I put one, one second in. We actually want to use 15. Um, but some data points are missing, so we'll use an EM algorithm to fill them in. We'll then use a Kalman filter to basically smooth everything. And then we'll go back and refit the missing points and so on. So what we end up with is a very nice algorithm and it's theoretically, it's brilliant. It comes up with lovely solutions. And in the paper, the, you know, when the first sort of paper of this, they ran with a 10-stock solution. And it's like, oh, this is great. What they didn't tell us was actually how long, well, what you don't get from the paper and what you don't realize is it's an absolute nightmare of an algorithm. And the reason it's a nightmare of an algorithm is because effectively you have this massive array of prices with lots of NAs. And you start by, we well, can go either way, effectively you start by going forward through it with a Kalman filter, and then you go backwards through it with a Kalman filter, and then you go through the whole thing with this EM algorithm, and then you repeat. And it's, it's a, it, it, it slowly converges, and the word slowly is very true. EM algorithms are awful for convergence. Um, but the problem with the Kalman filter, as I'll touch on, is basically you, it's, you, it's really hard to do it in parallel because you start with the first period, and then you go to the second one and the third one, and it, it depends on the period before, and then when I get to the last bit and I come back, same story. So it's really, really tricky to try and implement this. So anyway, we thought we'd love to do this. Um, and we started, and unsurprisingly for that second line or the second bullet point there, we started trying to use, do this in R. Uh, I'd be rather sort of bad standing up here at a conference, this conference not using R. Um, I suppose actually what the story should be is I ended up with R, I guess. I mean, that would be a better story, but we actually ended up somewhere else of R. Um, and I had a problem. So I took MSCI US, which is around, I can't remember, it's a few hundred companies, and each iteration, so that's just going through the data forward and backwards and then the EM algorithm bit, was taking 10,000 seconds. So it's two and three quarter hours. And there must be, I mean, I've never run this under 20 iterations in, in practice. It's probably close to 40 or 50. Um, so we're talking about a process that, as I say, 20 iterations takes two and a half days. If it's actually 40 iterations, we're up to five days. Or maybe it could be a bit more. It depends, on the, it depends actually on the data. Some weeks it's better than worse. But it could almost be a situation where it takes you more than a week to run something you want to run every week, which isn't very satisfying. Um, and anyway, even then, uh, one of the, the other problem we had is we had a 32 gigabytes of memory and we killed it uh, in about five iterations. Um, it's, I mean, this is where R's memory handling is not brilliant. Uh, and it's really easy in these sort of iterative algorithms. You set up as much as you can to avoid the problem. Um, we went through lots of sort of slight variations on which data structure we used and where you set stuff up in loops and did you pass things in as parameters. And we could sort of avoid the problem a little bit with the memory. Uh, so you could get it up to sort of seven or eight iterations before it crashed, but it crashed. Um, and there was, we were stuck. And so this led to, we've got a great algorithm. If I run it on 10 stocks, it's fine, it works. But with 600 or 700 stocks, it, it dies. I can't run it. So we went through various different, as we say here, we went through MATLAB, we went through R, we went through Julia, and we went through C++. Um, so where is the problem? And this is what I sort of said earlier. Um, EMs, EM algorithms are horribly slow to converge. There are modern techniques, which I think we should probably go into, because we could probably make it quicker. Um, and Kalman filters are really hard because they go through data. And we're doing loads and loads of matrix inversions in all this. And matrix inversions are, again, horribly slow. 
uh, order, I mean, I found this wonderful, their order n to the 2.373 if you have the best algorithm. Uh, and, you know, so as you're blowing up your, the size of your matrix, you're going up by the size of the matrix square, there's number of stocks squared at least, uh, yeah, much more than that, and order n3 if you do it badly. Um, so, lots of problems, and, and, you know, where did we go? So we thought, aha, there's this thing called Julia out there, and it's always sort of, you know, everything you hear about, it's not that new anymore, but it's newish. Um, and they sort of say it's high-level, high-performance, dynamic programming language, and yada, 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 and at some point they talk about how it's almost as fast as compiled code. Um, and so we thought, okay, fine, why don't we take our, our code and translate it, which originally started in, uh, it was actually started, a version of it was actually in MATLAB originally. Let's take it from R, let's put it into Julia, um, and uh, let's see if Julia solves our problems for us, because it's supposed to be better and more modern and everything. Uh, I will say, I did run into a, a, a real fascinating problem, um, which is this example at the bottom here. Um, if you type what I did here, so maximum of one comma two in a brackets as an array, uh, that's, a two, that's a two element array. The first element is a string, which is max, and the second element is a, I can't remember what they call it, it'd be a tuple if it were in, uh, in Python, the one comma two, a, a pair of numbers. But if you do max without a space, one comma two, that's a one element array, which is obviously gonna have the value two, because we can all do that bit. So this is a, I, I mean, why any language, barring the one that is just spaces, allows a space to mean something. I'll ignore Python here, that slightly annoys me as well, but Python at least is only at the start of the line. Um, why you would say that I can use a space as a separator to define an array, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I mean, this, this took me ages, and Stack Overflow, praise the gods who have set that up, uh, sort of to sort out. I couldn't figure this out. I mean, why on earth would you think this is true? Because you take the brackets away, the outside, the square brackets of defining an array, it works, max space one comma two is two. But as soon as you put the brackets around it, it becomes a two element array with two different things in. Why I don't get it, I mean it's bizarre. Um, apart from that, actually converting from uh, R to Julia is really quite neat. Uh, it doesn't use curly brackets, um, which I, as being a C programmer as my original training, uh, or my original programming language I find very weird. Um, you know, it, it, it's slightly less sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't do quite do as many brackets, so, you know, for for loops and things. But overall, as you can see, most of the code, there's slight variations, and it's quite nice. Um, if you want to transpose a matrix, you can just do a little transpose side. That's quite nice. Um, it was easy to do. Didn't take too long to transfer the code. Then we ran it. And um, this is, I mean, this is a slightly older version of Julia. I, I, so if I ran it today, I'm not sure if we'd get slightly different results. On Windows, it was about twice as slow as running R. And on, on Linux, um, it was about twice as quick. Um, there is this enable GIT uh, in R, which basically does a compilation of the code. Made zero difference to our problem. Um, and so this was, this was, by the way, this was now for a 10 by 10 problem. I cut down the problem really so, so I could actually measure the, how long these things took. Otherwise, I'd be sitting there for days. Um, and you can see, so Julia actually didn't, on my Windows box, didn't solve anything. And on my R box, on, my, on our Linux box, that was a bit quicker. Um, so you go, okay, well... Modern computers can do things in parallel. Um, does that help? Well, it doesn't really. As I say, the algorithm, because it's a very much iterative algorithm, uh, you know, you, sort of the value at t depends on t minus 1. It's very hard to parallelize. But the one bit you can parallelize is because we do a lot of this matrix algebra stuff, um, that's, you know, for those of you who know this, is this basic linear al algebra subprogram, so BLAS. Um, and those you can get in parallel. Um, Julia actually uses the parallel version, uh, but somehow I think we, what we found was, was there was a bizarre bug in the Windows version which meant it wasn't using anything in parallel, whereas in the Linux box it was automatically, hence the speed up. Um, so can we use this parallelism? Uh, on Windows, uh, we have to sort of say, thank Revolution Analytics. They produce this Revolution R, which has this Intel math kernel library in it. Uh, which is a classic, one of the implementations of the BLAS in parallel. On Linux, it's utterly trivial. Basically, you have to just swap out one file and put in another one. 
just a shared a sh a SO file. It's really quick. Um, and it makes a big, big difference. So, you know, for example, especially looking at the um, sort of the, the bottom sort of two down here, especially the bottom one is the particularly relevant one, doing a linear regression, which is effectively doing a, a matrix inversion, you know, I can speed up a 3, 000, inverting a 3,000 by 3,000 matrix from 7.4 seconds to 0.47. This is a big saving. Um, so first thing you can say is if you're doing anything with matrices in R, uh, or in any language, in fact, you should be using the better versions of the BLAS. The one that comes with R by default is single-threaded. It's dreadful, really. Um, but it's quite hard to sort of just have a default. But you, switching with these out is a great thing to do. Um, so did that help? Well, yes, it sort of did. Um, so R on Windows, I say I use a Revolution Analytics one. Uh, I got my 27 seconds down to 14. Uh, using Julia on, on Windows didn't really make a big difference. Um, and it, it just didn't, it wasn't really helping. I mean, the, the Revolution R was quite good. On Linux, we had a similar problem, yeah, similar results. It was quicker. But Julia wasn't the solution. Um, and we still, although all these things meant we could run it quicker, what this basically meant is we ran into the memory problem in about half the time we did at first. So we solved one problem and had a second one. So where did we end up? Well, what we actually ended up with was uh, this wonderful, obviously, package. We've all come across RCPP and RCPP Armadillo. Why Armadillo? It's a C library that does linear algebra. Why it's called Armadillo, I have no idea, but it's very good. And effectively, the biggest thing that really, the biggest benefit we had from this was in C++, you can control all the memory. So you can allocate memory at exactly the points you want. You don't end up duplicating things in memory. You have to be slightly careful. You don't overwrite something you need for the next period. Uh, but you know, it, 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 it allows you to do it. Again, this Armadillo library is really good. Um, so you can write stuff that looks like this. And as you can see, it's, it's very similar. I mean, you've got to be slightly careful and yeah, as always, as with anything when you're converting code, you've got to be sort of watch for the gotchas, but overall, all of this conversion was very, very fast. Um, and did that make a big difference? Well, yes. So all of a sudden, as you can see there, um, starting from my 30 seconds at the top, if I use uh, the Revolution R, uh, I'm down to four seconds. So nearly a factor of 10 improvement. And when I then blow this problem up into my 600 by 600 or my whatever size big matrix I'm using, um, all of a sudden it's feasible. So now we can run this stuff uh, on a, we run it every weekend. Uh, we run three of these processes. Uh, in, we actually, actually, we still have to run them uh, sequentially. Uh, we still can't run, uh, we do basically do one for Europe, one for Japan, one for the US. Uh, if we run all three together, we still kill the memory on the, uh, on the, on the Linux box. So it's not perfect, but it's at least usable. The, the longest one takes about nine, minute, nine hours, the shortest one takes about an hour. Which, when we're going from two and a half hours a loop, and I'm doing a lot of loops, was a pretty good improvement. So the message here is, is you know, I mean, I, like, I think you know, Julia wasn't a solution to our problem. Um, I had loads of problems actually getting Julia to work, I will also say that. Um, and, and, you know, in the end, it's, R was good for the de as a development tool, but C++ and RCPP, which if, if you never used it, is phenomenal, um, you know, were the way we managed to get this to work. So, uh, there's a lot of details there in terms of the actual algorithm I skipped over. Uh, if people are interested, obviously, we can share the slides. Uh, but with that, I will pause and say, uh, anybody, any questions? <laughs>